I started working in this area when I came to Argon, which was some 20 years ago. Uh, initially, I mean, I've always been interested in the question of how one can accelerate discovery in science by connecting resources or people with resources, resources together. So early on that meant I was working in parallel computing. Uh, in the early 90s, the first high-speed networks, the first gigabit test beds, test beds for example, uh, became available and uh, we, I and others, saw an opportunity to uh, enable new modes of discovery based on connecting people with remote remote computers, connecting computers together, instruments connected with computers, uh, etc. Yeah, the, I think a key point for us was uh, an activity that uh, Tom DeFonte and Rick Stevens, uh, I think, were the key players and organized in 1994. It was, I think, called the iWay, connected together uh, for the supercomputing conference. Uh, a set of 13 or so sites around the US using gigabit uh, test beds. And uh, I recognized that there was a lack of uh, any decent system software to allow applications to run on this system. So we built out a very, very quickly a, a simple software system that let people uh, authenticate, uh, connect together, run. I think there was a total of 50 applications that ran across the this uh, iWay uh, system. And from there, uh, that helped us both conceptualize and I think also get funding for the Globus uh, project which followed in 1996. Grid computing was introduced as a term and I think widely applied in, in academia um, to mean uh, on-demand computing, so outsourcing of computing to uh, some third party, a supercomputer center or some other computing service provider. It, it also uh, came to encompass the federation of computing or data or storage or other resources on, on large scales over wide area networks. So in that sense, uh, you know, grid computing had a fairly distinct meaning. Um, as industry enthusiasm for grid computing grew, the term started to be used for basically any sort of parallel computing. And so you had Oracle 10G, which was a database that ran on a cluster, or uh, IBM uh, Grid Server, which was a blade server that uh, you know, they rebranded as a grid server. And so in, for some people, I think grid computing is a synonym for a, a parallel uh, cluster computing. Now, we then have the emergence of cloud computing and I think that uh, initially, in a sense, was just another name for the original concept of grid, computing on demand, outsourced to uh, large uh, providers. What was really exciting and innovative about it was that for the first time we had large scale commercial providers of outsourced computing capabilities. So, you know, in the 90s we were trying to realize these ideas and the only people we could outsource to were supercomputer centers which are not very good places to outsource to it turns out. Now we have the likes of Amazon and Microsoft and Azure who are professional uh, very large scale providers of elastic uh, services. Um, with cloud computing taking off of course people in industry started wanting to broaden the meaning of this term and so they've started to use the word private cloud to mean something very similar to the commercial uh, grid concept, which is any form of, at the limit, any form of uh, commercial, uh, any form of in-house uh, cluster computing. Um, I think, uh, so in that sense, I think the two terms have very similar meanings. Now, you know, again, there's been innovation. We now have uh, widespread use of uh, virtualization, which wasn't, uh, you're really there 10 years ago uh, and so it is possible to do a better job of uh, providing on-demand computing within an enterprise uh, and so today's private clouds are more functional and useful than the grid systems of 10, of 10 years ago but they nevertheless remain you know, very different I think to the really exciting public cloud offerings. Right and some of that kind of goes back to a point that you made today and I think everyone there was kind of a pause in the room when you made this point. It's very simple, but it's well stated. 
you just wrote cloud equals hosting, right? Uh, grid equals federation. So I think some of that comes back to that. So can you sort of put that in, in, in this light and kind yeah. of explain that concept? Yeah, so I think uh, you know, what's exciting about cloud is people have worked out how to provide hosted services uh, in a you know, scalable, elastic, cost-effective manner. And those services may be infrastructure as a service in the context of you know, Amazon uh, and Microsoft Azure and so forth, or they can be software as a service as done by Salesforce, uh, Google, uh, Mail, etc. Et so those are, you know, the, the fact that people can do these things rely re reasonably reliably and cost-effectively uh, is transformative. Now, once you've done that, then you still face the problem of integrating together services and offerings from different uh, service providers from different institutions, etc. And that's the problem that you know is fundamental really to grid computing and science where the data that you want to uh, integrate is typically uh, elsewhere where the you know the people or the scientific instrumentation that you want to work with is really all in one place. And so we need federation uh, as much and in fact more than, than ever uh, we can perhaps increasingly rely on these cloud service providers to uh, provide us the hosting of the things that we're trying to federate. Do you think that your message, um, outside of just Globus Online, about the power of grid computing gets lost in the cloud hype? Do you think there is cloud hype? Do you think that there's still any grid hype left? And to what degree is any of that even important? No, oh, it's a, again a great question. So, yeah, there's certainly a tremendous amount of cloud hype. Uh, I don't feel I can complain about it because I certainly benefited from a lot of grid hype. It might uh, a few years ago. Um, yeah, so grid as a term was uh, incredibly popular for quite a while. It is now not so popular. Um, but the the problems remain, and in fact become, I think, more. Uh, uh, important uh, over time as, as computing technologies advance. How do we uh, accelerate discovery and innovation uh, in the world of the sciences by connecting researchers with the tools that they need to do their job? And that's the problem that we are trying to uh, solve and we're taking advantage of these new cloud technologies wherever we can. We still find a lot of technologies that were developed in the world of grid to be uh, very useful. Um, you know, what we're building with Globus Online, trying to outsource uh, complex IT activities from the lab to uh, software as a service uh, providers is maybe a hybrid of the two, and I think that's uh, that makes it, well, perhaps uh, hard to explain to people, but I think it makes it uh, very uh, exciting, and when people start to use it, they, they find it very uh, very natural and attractive. People are very bad at prediction, but you know, in a way we've been working for 50 years now, uh, back from John McCarthy in 1960, and maybe earlier, uh, to realize this, this ideal of offloading uh, uh, complex activities to, to uh, third parties. And, and it's, in a way, uh, almost uh, depressing to see how little progress we've made, but we're starting to make some progress. And I, I think what will be, what will be, what's likely to happen over the next five to ten years is we'll see that progress accelerating, as the places we're offloading and outsourcing to get exponentially faster and smarter. As they have more data, then they will be able to uh, use that data to do a better job of. Uh, well, if you're in the search business uh, doing search, if you're in the advertising business selling advertising, if you're in the research business perhaps detecting patterns in your data that you uh, might not have observed by yourself, finding connections between the work you're doing and the work that someone else is doing, um, uh, helping you to configure the simulations that will uh, move uh, your, your, your science forward and, and so forth. Great question. So, 
yeah, the, the key point I was making at the beginning of my talk today was that most research is performed in small or medium labs within institutions. So the University of Chicago is a very distinguished research university, but it has several hundred, it basically consists of several hundred in independent research labs, each of which has a PI and a few postdocs and some grad students. Uh, and they nevertheless, you know, despite this, these very, their very limited resources, they have to put together some very sophisticated information technology to move their work forward. And the same is true of, you know, the University of California, Berkeley, or the University of Illinois, or, you know, other, uh, m any of the, you know, several hundred uh, major research universities in the U.S. and the others uh, overseas. So we're interested in this question, I'm interested in this question of what would it mean to take the, or supply the information technology that these people need, um, not as a piece of software that they download and install in their labs, but as a, s a set of capabilities that they can access over the network as a service. Uh, so using software as a service, a concept which is, I think, quite familiar to people in industry. It's how you, if you start a small business nowadays, you uh, provide your payroll and your customer relationship management and your email and your web hosting, uh, all, all the things really you need to make a business work. Um, what would it mean to do the same sort of uh, thing for, for research? You know, if you see a, a, a large science project like, um, you know, the LIGO Gravitational Wave Observatory or the Large Hadron Collider, they'll have dedicated teams of people who run their IT for them. But if you're a small lab, uh, you know, maybe you need a tenth of a person, but you, it's very hard to hire a tenth of a person. So instead you may have nothing or you may have one of your grad students uh, run the pipelines, if you like, that are involved in collecting, managing, indexing, storing, analyzing uh, your data. And neither, none of those solutions is very satisfactory. So we think we can deliver it to people as a, a hosted uh, service, presumably at a much lower cost than, than people can deliver it themselves. So there are a lot of time-consuming activities uh, that involve information technology uh, in, a, in a modern day uh, research lab. We, we chose to focus initially on a very simple problem, at least a conceptually simple problem, that of moving data from one place to another. We started with that because it's a problem that quite a few of our current Globus users have and we know, we understand it quite well. And so the result is uh, something we call Globus Online. Uh, it's a hosted you know, cloud hosted, it actually sits on Amazon uh, computers, but it's from the perspective of the user, it's just a service somewhere in the network to which you can uh, you delegate uh, the task of managing the movement of your terabytes of data from one place to another. So the successful projects, I think, fall into maybe three main classes. We've got the very large infrastructures that are focused on resource sharing in science. So TerraGrid is an example of one open science grid. Uh, I, I, I guess although that's more focused on the needs of high energy physics. And then in Europe, uh, or worldwide, the Large Hadron Collider computing grid. Then we have uh, more domain specific uh, systems like the Earth System Grid which uh, delivered uh, all of the intergovernmental panel on climate change uh, data and has resulted in hundreds of publications in climate science. Uh, you know, these more d domain specific uh, deployments are often focused on data distribution for a particular uh, community. And, and then the third class which I think I, I, a smaller scale but I still like other ones that are more maybe campus or state level uh, resource uh, sharing uh, systems. So, you know, when you were talking about some of these use cases, the theme that kept emerging was big data that keeps getting bigger. 
So what kinds of limitations, either with Globus or in general, are we going to run up against um, as data keeps growing in size? Yeah, yeah, other, so other, than the, other than the laws that exist on this. Yeah, so you know, what's, what's interesting about uh, data is it's, it's so, in so many fields, data used to be scarce, and now it's plentiful. And that, you know, like many things in technology, it changes uh, the nature of the critical path to discovery and it changes the terms of the equations. Uh, so, you know, certainly a set of things that one took for granted, like managing data, you would stick it on a floppy disk and it would sit in your desktop drawer. Now suddenly you can't do that anymore. You've got to be more sophisticated and professional in how you manage your data. Uh, people increasingly need to become more collaborative because in order to make sense of large quantities of data, you need to team with others who have expertise in uh, data analysis, statistics, machine learning, uh, uh, etc. Um, we need to be smarter in the algorithms that we apply because the quantity of data is increasing faster than the uh, amount of computing that we have uh, available to us. Um, and you know, in general, the demands for computing are increasing, and that's another reason why cloud computing, outsourced computing, is becoming uh, so popular. Uh, you know, our, our desktop machines get faster at a certain rate, but computing demands are growing much faster than that because of this need to process large amounts of data, and that's uh, also having a big, a big transformational impact.